Good day to you all, my name is Lucas. Today I spoke to GP Xavier and Aaron Van Os. GP Xavier hosts his own channel. I will link it down below. He makes videos about philosophy, um, different thinkers, different ideas, very in-depth content, much recommended. And he has some conversations as well. I've spoken to him, I think, three times already. And then Aaron, who's been on many times, my brother, he did a thesis on Nietzsche, master's thesis, named the pious Antichrist, arguing that Nietzsche is more of a religious thinker than many might think. And today I got them to talk uh, to me. Um, we had a lovely conversation about Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Basically Nietzsche's most important work, I think according to himself and many others as well. I tried reading it, uh, quite a challenge. And I went through some questions with them about the book and in general about the worldview that Nietzsche creates in this book. And these are some really important topics, I think. They're existential. They are um, very much related to the meaning crisis. Nietzsche could be seen as a prophet of the meaning crisis. And um, yeah, well worth your time, I hope. And we'll have a part two as well. But this is just a little prelude. I hope you guys enjoy, and we'll catch you next week. Okay, welcome back to the channel. I'm joined by Aaron and GP Xavier. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Lucas. Okay, good. You know, last time I said welcome, and Stefan and my dad didn't say anything. So I was like, is this the new ethic? But uh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's always difficult to know when you need need to speak or not, you know. Like especially, I, I think I think I think GP was also just about to respond, so that's exactly. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> if the pause is like more than three seconds, I'm like I'm gonna go. But uh, <laughs> today we're gathered to discuss a book and a man, Aaron, and um, you. There we go. Show your cool version as well. Okay. So for those listening, he's showing Das Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Yes. He's got an English and a Dutch version. <laughs> I have the cooler version in German, which Thank I you. don't read. Just bought it as a trophy. But uh, Aaron, you told me that it's unwise to read this book before having read the rest of Nietzsche. Hmm. Um, why is that? To start yeah. with. So I'm not saying it necessarily has to be. I think you could be an exception and some of your viewers might be an exception because they're like a little bit more aware of like some of the Nietzschean ideas floating around. But I do think it's a fairly inaccessible work, especially if you're expecting a non-fiction work because it is like kind of a fictional work, but it is a fictional work that has very uh, explicit working working out of like of, of, of his ideas. And I'd also say that there is something... And uh, yeah, we can also discuss this a little with with with, with GP. Some of his, uh, his his other works, like he put out it like in a span of months. So he would like take a couple of months to just quickly write aphorism, 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 and just like throw it out there in the world. Uh, so you can kind of read it in that way too. That you really feel like okay, this is somewhat difficult and intense, but it's also accessible in a different way. Whereas for this one, he he definitely spent like a couple of years writing it. So I, I, I know that many people start with it because it's like a famous title, but I also know it's actually one of his more complex wor works because of the form, because of the time he spent writing it. Um, and maybe also because of some of the baggage that is associated with it. And that has to do, for instance, with national socialism, but it also has to do a little bit um, with his own psychological breakdown that, uh, for instance, Jung writes about. And therefore, it might it might not be the ideal book to focus on the ideas, if that makes sense. And some of his other works are a bit yeah. more similar to that. But that's just a short reply. Yeah. Okay. Uh, GP, you made a four-hour video, <laughs> <laughs> which I, uh, I listened to fully. I thought it was excellent. And, um, Thank you. What drove you to this work and why did you feel like making a longer than a Lord of the Rings movie video about <laughs> it? Um, so I um, I think I first read Zarathustra probably when I was a teenager or at least started to or tried to. Um, but it's, I think it is not self-evident. It's not easy to understand. Um, 
especially without having read other Nietzsche. And I think also coming from the approach that I took to that video, it's also a little bit esoteric, like it's a little bit deliberately structured to have hidden levels of meaning. Um, and so it didn't really mean much to me then. Uh, I think it was last year, a couple of years ago, I, was, I read it again and I read it with um, Lawrence Lampert's commentary, um, which is what I based my commentary video on. And it, it clicked for me. It made a whole lot of sense. And it, it was just fascinating. Uh, and it was just a real um, experience, like a <laughs> revelatory experience in a way. Mm. And so I so I said to myself, then I want to eventually do a video about this to kind of break down the book for other people. Um, and so I came back to it recently and it was much more work than I thought it would be, but it was very rewarding. And um and yeah, and then then I produced the video um, and and really got to know the book a lot better. Um, I know it's mostly just through this um, one um, scholar's interpretation, um, but with a few few insights here and there that I sort of found myself. But um, I know there's more and more depth to the book as well. So yeah, yeah, I think I. I would be completely lost if it wasn't for your video, to be honest. Uh, it helped me give some structure to what I was reading. Um, I was wondering, I think one of the things you said in the in the video was that this book is kind of more like a positive vision in the sense yes. that Nietzsche actually creates instead of criticizes in this book. Yes. Um, either one of you can answer this, but why do you think he felt the need or why did he create a positive vision? for the for the world and then we can go deeper into that i don't know if any of you feels compelled to respond to that one i'll okay. take a yeah. stab at it if that's right aaron yeah. yeah yeah um so why why did he want to formulate a positive vision i think that um like he's essentially he's reacting to nihilism and he's reacting to the philosophy of schopenhauer um which sort of heavily influenced him um in his sort of earlier, earlier days, um, which was a, the philosophy of Schopenhauer is very pessimistic, um, kind of, kind of sees life as being wrong or a mistake or something that should be escaped. Mm. Um, and then nihilism in general, just being the, the collapse, you know, the death of God, the irrelevance of God, the collapse of the old ideals. Um, and, you know, Nietzsche, played a part in this in a way like like you mentioned he his other work is very critical so he's kind of on the side of the enlightenment in many ways in destructing or deconstructing these ideals including god so you might see him as just a nihilist but what nietzsche wanted to do was to have a positive vision he wanted to not be a gloomy nihilist but to be a joyful but wise person could you have wisdom and joy at the same time? Um, one of his books is called The Gay Science or The Joyful Science. Um, and so that's what Zarathustra sets out, a vision of the world which doesn't lean on or need um, metaphysical ideas or let's say um, sort of platonic forms, gods, the, the transcendent, the everything that's above us and supernatural. It doesn't need that but it's still a positive vision. Um, it's still a life that can be lived full of joy, a certain degree even of reverence. Um, and I think that's what he's trying to do um, with Zarathustra. And that's what separates him from other nihilists. Um, is he a nihilist in a sense? Yes, but a very peculiar kind of nihilist. Yeah, I think Nietzsche himself makes a distinction between active and passive nihilism, nihilism and that he does more or less identify with this sense of active nihilism where you basically go through the nihilism in order to mm -hmm. arrive at the other side of uh, the the tunnel <laughs> um and i don't know like so, so, so i definitely see that in it one thing that i would also add and that's like it was in your response already that he somewhat seems to respond to Schopenhauer because his first major work, which was the birth of tra tra tragedy, you could argue that that was also a positive work. Like, I mean, he criticizes, let's say, 
contemporary society because he he notices that let's say after the understanding and uh, the life and the society of Attic Greece things seems to have made like uh, a downward turn where with the introduction of Socrates and Euripides and Plato um, and that more or less has fueled our own understanding of reality and you could say that there's already a positive vision in there because he he argues that what they had in Attic Greece was a positive engagement with life at the same time though that work is still very much influenced by his love for Schopenhauer and his love for uh, Richard Wagner as well. Uh, and you could kind of see that he stepped away from that too. So all of those aspects that only later on he saw that actually maybe some of this Wagnerian revival of music is just an escape from reality and it's not actually trying to confront reality. And also it might be filled with a certain form of resentment. And the same thing you have with Schopenhauer in a different front is that actually Schopenhauer's metaphysics are to some extent just also trying to be an escape from this world uh, and to that extent I do think Zarathustra is a little bit more unique even than that because he's really trying to say like no I want to affirm reality completely as it is which I think he was starting already in the birth of tra tra tragedy but mm. it comes out a bit more fully in this work if something that came up in your discussion that I wanted to respond to or at least I wanted to open up again was this um, Dionysian versus Christian worldview, at least the worldview that Nietzsche is making here versus the Christian one. And what, what popped up to me right away was like, I never considered Christianity to be a worldview that doesn't also affirm life in a sense. So it was kind of a surprise to me. Um, and it made me wonder what is the Christianity that Nietzsche was responding to exactly. Um, and also I know that, that, he was responding to Plato in a sense, and he called, what was it? Platonism is, uh, Christianity is a Platonism. Platonism for the people. Yeah, yeah exactly. That uh, kind of surprised me. Um, so yeah, I was wondering where, where that comes from. And maybe Aaron, do you know what is the, what is the reason for that? Hmm. I would say something had to do with um, how, like when Nietzsche says that God is dead, he is also ta talking about how several of these, let's say, atheist thinkers, enlightenment thinkers have contributed to the death of God, even though some of them identified as Christians themselves. So he would include, like, let's say, Descartes or uh, Immanuel Kant, like, probably as people who killed God, even though they were trying to rescue him, <laughs> in some sense. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that they further... Um, they further promoted... Uh, some of these aspects like truth at the expense of other aspects like you know like truth should also be uh, let's say combined with a sense of beauty and, and 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 maybe myth is actually very important where some of these enlightenment thinkers like they became from um, theists they became more let's say more often they became deists like okay god seems to function a purpose in their system that they construct but it's unclear how that God is anything close to, let's say, you know, the God of religion, which is also tied to, like, a, let's say, a specific myth. And I'm not just speaking of the, the crucifixion myth here, but let's say the, the, the whole Bible in general, but you could also obviously also include other religions there. So he was interested that, like, this, um, this understanding of, of God throughout the time, like that actually God is truth and we value truth for its own sake. And you obviously see how that can be influenced by Plato too, obviously very much uh, uh, also promoted the, 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 the value of truth. Um, that if that happens, then you are, some people have been prone to say like, well, then actually these aspects of religion, like they make a little bit less sense, but we really appreciate this aspect of religion. But by doing that, you create like let's say a smaller and smaller island of truth yeah which sort of rejects everything else in religion up until the point that even you start doubting about that where and you got people like david hume or like well actually some of these proofs supposed proofs for god aren't even that strong like you could easily easily argue them away and then you get like this whole drive for truth which already rejected so much of religion also rejecting itself so basically the christianity that existed in his time had become very pathetic because people didn't seem to fully appreciate the whole of it anymore and it was also you have to understand like this was obviously post-protestantism but at a point where protestantism had 
become fairly uh, weak. And you can see that also that one of his contemporaries, Søren Kierkegaard, is also yeah. struggling against some of these aspects of Christianity that they seem to have weakened out over time. So I always try to understand it a little bit in that context. Um, and just for like the biographical details that are relevant, like his own father was also a, a Lutheran pastor. So that's definitely an environment that he grew up in. So he was not too familiar with, let's say, um, um, a Protestant understanding of a different time or of a Catholic understanding or of a Luth uh, of an orth Orthodox understanding. So that's all relevant as a thing to include, but maybe GP is something to add. I mean, I found it really interesting that you said um, that you sort of never thought of Christianity as being a life denying religion. Um, I'm no, I'm not, I'm not arguing that it is, um, but it's, Hmm. How to convey this? Hmm. I mean, if we just look at it doctrinally, um, the the teaching of Orthodox Christianity. I'm using Orthodox as a small O, so that encompasses Protestantism, Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, the 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 dogma is that the world has fallen, so nature itself is already corrupted. You know, the fact the fact that um, the animals. Um, eat each other, the fact that we have sexual desires that aren't completely in our control and only solely focused on our spouses, you know, all of this is the, the nature of matter is actually corrupted and fallen and bad. And then, of course, you add to that the notion that, um, which is an orthodox Christian notion, that you're not saved until you're baptized, that, that you know, whether it's because of original sin, however that's conceived, but you are basically going to hell unless you're saved. I mean, this is just orthodox Christianity. So I don't think it's a huge stretch to see um, why Nietzsche would attack traditional Christianity as being against life. And then you combine that with the kind of asceticism that was practiced by um, saints, all the, all the exceptional saints uh, you know, through most of the history of the church, would 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 have ascet been ascetics. They would have tortured themselves in some way, um, whether just through fasting or like literally putting barbs in their flesh or whatever it might have been, um, living on the top of pillars. Um, the idea that you know the body is essentially sinful. So so this is kind of also what Nietzsche is reacting to in a broader sense. I think that though, like alluding to what Aaron was talking about, maybe. Uh, he sees the effects of Christianity, of this life to now, extending beyond just doctrinal Christianity into a kind of mode of being, a way of being, which denies life, the body, the earth, and um, is really ascetic. So you can have a really ascetic philosophical type. You can have a really ascetic kind of scientific type. This is, this is where truth becomes merged with God, where um, the whole thing is very much... Like, it's not a joyful science, but it's just like a, everything is subservient to truth. Um, and so I think that's where he's coming from. Now, is that the true essence of Christianity? Um, I know there's certainly people who would argue otherwise. But the other ideal that Nietzsche contrasts it with, the imagery is very much the opposite of this. So Dionysus is, is a orgiastic god. His followers are believed to have engaged in ecstatic um, dances, rituals, probably of a sexual nature as well. He's the god of wine. Um, he's a god of the earth, essentially. Um, and so Nietzsche's kind of saying, well, look, you can have the kind of, you know, the, the, the god that becomes a man to be crucified and to return to heaven, where, where hopefully you'll go as well and escape the earth. Or you can have Dionysus, the god of the earth, the god of the joy of the earth and choose between the two i know aaron doesn't think it's so much a choice between the two but uh, something else but but there you go beautiful okay so i feel when i think of at least my understanding of of christianity is not um it doesn't separate heaven and earth in a sense in many ways, to me, it unites it, and that's why I was a bit uh, surprised by the by the view you had because I I acknowledge everything you're saying is true, but I also see in in Christianity a form of life affirmation 
especially if you compare it, for example, to the Gnostics, where the Gnostics, you know, would really deny actively life and um, really focus on the, the spiritual as opposed to a life on earth. Whereas in my understanding, um, God becoming man shows the importance of the incarnation, um, something I spoke about last week as well in a, in a talk with, uh, with Stefan and my dad, where, where life on earth actually becomes very important and, and also holy in a way, you know, mm. that I, I would agree. Okay. I, I think that's a great, I think that's a great um, response to Nietzsche actually, is that um, maybe his critique applies more to something like Islam or something a bit more abstract and transcendent, but the incarnation certainly implies that, um, you know, the world is not just something to be escaped from, that it has some kind of intrinsic value that even God can inhabit. So I, I would agree um, with you to a point. Um, I think the other thing to really bring into this is the other doctrine of Christianity, which is that, you know, we do live in a fallen world, but eventually that world will be restored to perfection. And that will be on the last day when the dead are raised and everyone will live eternally with God in individual existence, with their bodies transformed into some other kind of body. Um, and so, you know, that that's the vision. That's the vision. Now, what to do with this? Maybe this is going too far afield, um, but I would say that Nietzsche would see a doctrine like this and say, well, look, look, it sounds like you're affirming the earth, but, but you're not really affirming the earth because this doesn't make any sense. Like, this is not a plausible outcome. Like, you're not going to have this world. Um, so, so by proposing it as the solution, it doesn't achieve anything. And what you're really doing is you're denying the world as it actually is, namely a world of the will to power, a world of lusts, of earthly joys, uh, of all this kind of change and mortality. Um, do you see what I'm saying? And so I think that that yeah. would be his response. No, I get that. I, you know, we spoke about, it's funny you bring that up because we spoke about this theological idea, I think you and me in one of our first talks and like mm. trying to grapple with it. And at the time, I remember myself saying like, I, I don't understand it. Um, it doesn't make intuitive sense to me at all, but I don't reject it because I think it goes much deeper than my analytical understanding. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something I worry about in this interpretation or Nietzsche's interpretation here is like, well, do you really understand what that transformation means? Do you understand what's meant by body, for example? Um, it, it feels to me as if it's more of a um, analytical critique, let's say, whereas some of these ideas to me are very mystical. And I find it hard to reject an idea before I even understand it. And I don't know if many people do. Um, yeah, I think. We, sorry, go ahead. Fair, Nietzsche also doesn't really zero in on that idea specifically. Yes. Okay. He's much more focused on, <clears throat> let's say, uh, indeed, like the lives of certain saints. So he's always focused on individuals as symptoms of bigger movements. Uh, that's at least very often what he seems to do. So he points to certain things that Paul said, you know, but also other saints, um, which I totally agree with you, Lucas. Like, th that's also why. Uh, that point that you uh, sometimes raise, GP, like it doesn't ring as true uh, probably to us simply because we we've never been raised with that understanding of it. Like we've always been raised, like to of with a Christianity in a secular world. So always like to kind of be, let's say, and for instance, like our uh, our dad, he has always raised us with that understanding that okay, you know, many people treat the Bible as if it's let's say like a literal world, uh, uh, like or a literal word in some sense of what's true and that sometimes maybe it could be like a little bit more symbolic and it's like well the key is actually to read it the other way around and say like it's all of it is symbolic and some of it actually happened which is actually mm. super interesting like and, and then it's interesting to, to look at oh but what also took place let's say physically speaking because i know the literal part is always a bit uh annoying so we've always been i think raised and i'm not saying this obviously this is then not an argument for christianity as a whole but i'm just trying to um 
explain a little bit to you why we might not uh, hold on to that belief as much. Raised in this sense that, yes, you take everything about Christianity seriously, but also but but also loosely that's at the same time. It's like it, it was always this interplay, maybe a little bit of a potent processing, dare I say. <laughs> yeah. I think that um um I think that Nietzsche would look at the um function of a doctrine. Um what yeah. what function is it serving? And so um uh yeah, you're you're right, Aaron. He didn't focus too much on that particular doctrine. Um, but um, I'm sort of I'm I'm honing in on it because I think it is a good response and it is a response that people use to sort of say, um, but no, like I think I've heard Peugeot use it, which is fair enough. Like it's a good response to say no, actually, um, Christianity doesn't deny the world; it affirms the world because it looks forward to the perfection of the world of material, physical creation. Um, so I think it's important for that reason. What Nietzsche would do is he'd look at that and he'd say that the function of this doctrine is to deny the world because it denies the world as it actually is. And so that's important for Nietzsche. And what Nietzsche is trying to do with Zarathustra is articulate a philosophy and an orientation towards the world that, af that affirms it completely. And so this is why I think this issue is important um, because I think that whilst on a practical level, you can use certain doctrines, certain intuitions or faiths, um, maybe several of several conflicting ones at the same time, perhaps, to navigate life, to, um, you know, to, to gain insight, to, to gain motivation, to move through life. Um, on the ultimate level, if we're talking about the deepest level, I think that it gets problematic because if your doctrines are fundamentally from a Christian background, you have to ask the question, well, are they for the world as it is or are they against the world as it is? That seems to, to actually be a preoccupation of Nietzsche's. Mm -hmm. Is this philosophy for the world or against the world? Um, and again, Zarathustra is an attempt to articulate a philosophy that is joyful based only on the world as it is. Yeah. So there is a meme. It's, it's called reject the world, embrace uh, orthodoxy or something or tradition. So I, <laughs> yes. I do it. Like I, I, I recognize what you're saying. Like there's some, some truth to it for sure. Um, no, I, I don't, I, I don't agree. I think that the reject the world is more like reject the masses, reject the mainstream media. Like I think that that's, yeah, but the, I, I think that's that's different than what GP is talking. No, no, about. I know, but I think it points to something. Yeah. But when I think that people saying a reject the world, exactly what you're saying, there's a big nuance to it. I think it's it's making sure that you don't forget that there's something beyond it, or let's say that our lived experience and our lived reality is not to be absolutized, but it doesn't make it not real. That's that's the way I'm thinking about it, at least. Um, I, I, I would, by the way, add to what has just been said that, uh, like the the revolution of the Peugeot brothers, let's say in this lit, lit, little little <laughs> point, is precisely to go against the tendency to want to interpret everything having to do with Christianity in an ethical manner, like exclusively ethical, saying like, oh, how should we act? Or actually, no, this is good. Even even though the world is bad, we should act this way. And it's trying, like, they're trying to show and and and, and re reveal that actually many aspects of scripture try to just portray the world as it is. So like they, like, I'm not sure if that would be like a counter uh, to Nietzsche in some sense, or even to, to, to your point at the moment, but I do think it's important that it seems that many, that, that in this online space, what we're now discussing um, is there seems to be this awareness that this purely ethical understanding of Christianity actually seems to reject some core aspect of, reality as it is like very fundamentally and therefore they're trying to tie whatever they find in scripture now a little bit more better to like okay no this is actually revealing reality as it is it's itself and that would that could be like if you go into like let's say there are arguments for that of like how uh the account of genesis literally describes let's say like your own experience of the world and also the way that reality lays itself out to put it in like say a Peugeotian uh, way um <laughs> that that could be like a counter argument to the understanding that Christianity is all about, well, actually the world is broken, but we're going to go against it. And at least 
act in this way. But I'm curious how you look at that uh, GP, but maybe also I interrupted you, Luca, so feel free to finish your point. <laughs> no, that's all good. I, why don't you respond, GP, and then I have another question on top of it uh, to continue. I think that um, I think that there's a lot that is true in what you say, but I think that at the end of the day, at least Jonathan Peugeot, I think his brother isn't actually a Eastern Orthodox, but certainly Jonathan Peugeot is going to ultimately have, um, and has said he, he has Orthodox dogmas, like he believes the dogmas of the church, and the dogmas of the church are what they are. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it's not it's not just a description of um, it's not just a description of how the world is. It is um, you know looking forward to a different kind of reality. However, what you said about the ethical, I I, I would agree with that. Um, I would say I think Nietzsche thinks similarly. This is maybe a strange point of convergence because the ethical, in, by its very nature, condemns the world as it is. Like, you know, you, you're only, if you're, if you're thinking ethically, you're thinking this should be, but this shouldn't be, you know mm. what I mean? And so that's why Nietzsche wants to move beyond the ethical. Um, mm. And, and in the birth of tragedy, for instance, he, he mentions in favor of the aesthetic. The aesthetic is the way to um, look at the world, um, not ethical. Um, if you're looking at the world ethically, you're condemning different parts of it. If you're looking at it aesthetically, you're kind of seeing how, the good and the bad fit together in a in a way that is overall um valuable um so but, but so, by yeah. the way like this is mm. a really interesting point where kierkegaard and nietzsche would have had maybe a very interesting conversation because as you know for kierkegaard like if the three mm. existence mm -hmm. spheres we have like say the aesthetic the ethical and the religious and it's like mm -hmm. oh for him, for him obviously the aesthetic is not let's say the one that is closest yes. to reality itself no that that would be the religious so that would be some like it, it's just like let's say a footnote to what you were saying because I I uh, more or less agree with everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, my turn. Yes, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is excellent. Uh, I'm really happy with both your thoughts. I have a lot to reflect on and think about. One thing that I really appreciated in in your talks, but also GP your video, um, is that I'm really updating my understanding of. Nietzsche and that like so much of it is has been straw man and um mm -hmm. and I find that generally with philosophers like philosophers will always be reduced to the things that they get wrong <laughs> or mm -hmm. like, like you know with Descartes everyone's always shitting on Descartes <laughs> it's also like a brilliant mind yeah um, I, I know and yeah that that brings me to my question of I want to start with the the will to power uh that's what it's called right the will to power yeah it's something that's, that gets brushed over quick, quickly and it gets talked about a lot but i don't think it's get it gets explained a lot or expanded on mm -hmm. um could either one of you just give me a, a better idea of what it actually is yep i'll i'll give it i'll give a go based on a little bit i've read um from lampert um, Strawson, um, Galen Strawson has a lecture also on YouTube where he talks about Nietzschean metaphysics and basically says he agrees with them. Um, the will to power is, um, Lampert in his book talks about it as energy, basically. It's, he says that but it's what we would just consider in modern physics as energy. That is to say that, and, and this can, this coheres with Nietzsche's view because he, um, because Nietzsche says, um, that everything has will to power. Even inanimate objects have will to power. So it's not just living things, although in Zarathustra he emphasizes living things, it's everything. And that would accord with modern physics. Everything is basically composed of energy. Um, Nietzsche actually argued against the idea of atoms, like which is again, relatively consistent with modern physics because you could see everything as being composed of energy it's not like they've got the you know even the fundamental particles are a little bit ambiguous about what their nature is yeah so one way to look at it scientifically is as energy and what i mean by this is it has no purpose it's not going somewhere it hasn't chosen somewhere to go and then decided hey here's how i'm going to get there it just is pure force it does what it does it expands in the way that it expands and it's just like a a positive thing like a self 
self-propelling thing. Um, so that's one way to look at it. Another way that I find helpful to look at it um, certainly isn't from Nietzsche per se, but um, in e Indian religions, um, there's like a notion of Shakti, which is the energy of the universe, the feminine energy of the universe. And I think it's very coherent with that as well, because um, this again is purposeless. There's a similar concept called Leela, which is divine play. Um, the idea in Hinduism or some forms of Hinduism being that the whole universe is just God's divine play. Now, the, the key, the, the, the word play here is important. Again, it's purposeless. It doesn't have a defined purpose. It's just the self-expression of energies and potentials. So this is how I would describe the will to power is this, this um, we've got this energy within us and we want to use it in some way. The other final thing I'll just mention about it, which comes from Zarathustra, is um, in, in the chapter on self-overcoming where Zarathustra talks about um, will to power, one of the few places he talks about it um, in any depth, um, he says, you know, life, life said to me, I am, um, well, let me see if I can find the actual passage so I don't um, mutilate the quote. Mm -hmm. um, just give me one yeah. moment. Got the book here. I think it's I might cut it down anyway. So you're good. So, and life itself told me the secret. Behold, it said, I am that which must overcome itself again and again. So there's this other interesting aspect to will to power, which is that um, it's, it's different than Schopenhauer's will to existence or will to life. It's not just about survival. It actually overflows survival um so another quote from the same chapter and the lesser surrenders to the greater that it may have delight and power over the least of all so the greatest too surrenders and for the sake of power stakes life the devotion of the greatest is to encounter risk and danger and play dice for death in other words even the strongest even with the mo the ones with the most power um what do they do with it? They don't do it. They don't use it to cling to life. They don't use it to perpetuate their own individual existence. They overflow and do something extremely risky or, you know, venture something. Um, and that seems to be true in terms of human psychology. Um, and so there's this other aspect to it, which is self overcoming. Um, the will to power is something that um, binds individual forms together, and then eventually it is the thing that breaks individual forms apart. Um, and the whole thing is, in a sense, joyous. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> That's something I would expect. Aaron, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think. And, and, yeah, I, th I think I'm generally consistent uh or like my view is generally consistent with uh, what gp has said like it's also like for instance spinoza talks about the 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 canatus like our 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 tendency to to preserve ourselves and that everything is dominated by this canatus and like Nietzsche says very specifically like spinoza is wrong about this mm. you know, appreciate mm -hmm. him in other ways that, that like no everything wants to wants to wants to expand and uh that's also by the way why he in some sense disagrees with with Darwin, who also thinks, looks mm -hmm. at reality and says, like, okay, you know, everything is just trying to survive. Like, no, no, everything is doing much more than mere survival. Um, mm -hmm. And that's indeed that constant self overcoming. So that's just additions to basically what GP is yeah. already doing very well. Can I continue to ask you um, about the Ubermensch? I think that this concept was only in uh, this book. Is that correct? Something I learned? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I just wanted to say, like, it's it's often made out to be this very big idea, like, of Nietzsche's, even though he speaks about it very, fairly briefly. But I think, as GP also pointed out, like, he does speak of higher men. So uh, that is okay. a more consistent theme in his. But maybe you want to say something different, GP, yeah. No, no, I, I would agree. I think he does mention it el elsewhere. Is that accurate, um, Aaron? But maybe not very much. Um, yeah. Maybe, or maybe he doesn't use this specific term. I know that he does refer to it in Genealogy of Morals. Um, I don't know if he uses the term Ubermensch, but um, if you look at Zarathustra as, the, as a book, um, yes, you've got the Ubermensch there a fair bit, but <laughs> if you look at where you've got it, it's 
almost all confined to part one. Yeah. Um, it, it occurs a few times um, throughout the rest, but um, actually most of those times are sort of retrospective, like that he's looking back at his career and saying, I preached the Ubermensch to these people. He dro essentially drops the idea after um, book one, um, after part one. And this is something that's key to, um, this is key to Lampert's interpretation of Zarathustra. Basically, um, the popular view of Nietzsche is that he preaches the um, Superman, that eventually someone will come that will be so great that um, they'll kind of justify existence, justify the past, um, you know, make everything worthwhile, maybe start a new way of being or a new society or create new values or something like that. That's the popular idea of the Ubermensch. Um, you see it present in part one. Um, Zarathustra says the Ubermensch shall be the meaning of the earth. He's very much a preacher of the Ubermensch and all his, um, all his, what would you say, legislation for his followers to follow, the way that they should marry, the way that they should die is related to how to bring about the Ubermensch. You should die in a way that brings about the Ubermensch. You should reproduce in a way that brings about the Ubermensch. You should maintain friendships in a way that brings about the Ubermensch. But all this stops in the second part um, and why does it stop? So it stops because um, Zarathustra slash Nietzsche recognizes that this is not a true solution to the problem. And he, it's because he gets a deeper sense of the problem. The problem is a deep resentment that humans have in relation to time. Um, and so... He also suffers from that in part one. He hates the small man. Mm. He can't stand, he can't stand like, he can't stand those small people that are resentful themselves. He, he sees with resentment against them. And so he recognizes that the Ubermensch is just an attempt for him to come to terms with this, to find a solution, but it's futile because it just fuels his resentment. And so what he does instead is he, in part three, so you could you could divide it up like this. Part one is about the um, the Superman. Part two is about will to power, and this is the turning point. And part three is about eternal return. Eternal return is essentially what replaces the Ubermensch doctrine. And eternal return is almost the opposite of the Ubermensch. The Ubermensch says that history should be a progression to the Ubermensch. Eternal return says one should will the eternal return of all things. Um, and that for him is true liberation, redemption, um, healing. <laughs> and why is that? Because it heals one from resentment against time. If one is strong enough and joyful enough to affirm all of being, then one doesn't need to try and find other solutions or other ideals or other things to, um, to kind of deal with the fact that things are as they are. The past is forever frozen, if that makes sense. It does. Do you mean to say by that that the Ubermensch as a concept was something that um, he wouldn't even stand behind within the same book? Like, Well, it depends what you consider to have done to him to have done with it. Lampert strongly implies that, in a sense, Zarathustra becomes the Ubermensch, but... This is an Ubermensch conceived in a different way, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so he takes on the role of the Ubermensch, but it's a different kind. By then, it's a different kind of thing because the role of the Ubermensch is different now. The role of the Ubermensch is to will the eternal return and preach the eternal return um, and essentially to inaugurate a new epoch of humanity. Um but it's not a human. It's not a new epoch that's going to make everything perfect. It's not going to abolish the small man. It's still going to be full of you know chaos and randomness, yeah. and it's not going to solve that. But it's yeah. Is the so is the eternal return and and becoming in that sense, the Ubermensch, if I understand correctly, um, is that something individuals can attain, and is that something Nietzsche encourages individuals to attain? Like this state so, of, it sounds like overcoming death anxiety, you know, it sounds like overcoming this, this, uh, this way of living where you're actually content with what is. 
Is that what it is? I would say I'll, I'll give you Lampert's interpretation. Um, I'm not saying that this is definitive or the true interpretation, but his interpretation is that there was only one Ubermensch, and that was Zarathustra. And of course, Zarathustra is a stand in for Nietzsche. So basically, the Ubermensch was Nietzsche himself, and that Nietzsche knew this, um, but he didn't want to broadcast it because that level of, um, let's say, apparent arrogance or narcissism. Um, didn't look very good. So he kind of concealed it a little bit. Um, but the reason he says this is because he really believes that Nietzsche's, um, what Nietzsche accomplishes in Zarathustra is so important that it really is going to influence humanity for centuries to come. That's, that's Lampert's faith. And so that's why he thinks that he's the Ubermensch. There's only one Ubermensch for Lampert. And I think that has textual evidence for it. In Zarathustra, the book, Ubermensch is always in the singular. There's only one exception where it's in the plural, and that's when it's kind of used. Um, it, it's used as a, it's a complicated situation. It might be too, too, too much to go into it, but mm -hmm. there's a chapter against poets, and then Zarathustra plays all these tricks on a disciple where he kind of um, gives him paradoxes to solve, riddles to solve. One of the things he says to him is, you know, um, poets invent gods and Ubermensch, Ubermenschen, I guess would be the plural, right? Um, and so um, it's used negatively and the only time it's used in the plural. All the other times it's singular. So, so in answer to your question then, yeah, there's only been one Ubermensch. And that's him. And we can't be Ubermenschen after him because we'd just be copying him. Do you know what I mean? Like he gives the doctrine, we, um, we obey it. Like you can imitate Christ, but you can't be Christ. Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> no, so like, I, I, I am, I'm actually fairly hesitant about this interpretation, but it, it's one of those, like this is really where the, 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 the scholar in me comes alive because now I'm like, I'm, I'll be honest, like I have a little tab open right now and looking through Nietzsche's corpus for the word Übermensch because I, I want to look at like his use of it because this sounds... Actually, I knew you would do that. I knew yeah, you would. <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, uh, this this interpretation uh, for me. I By the way, could I just like, before I respond, I want to read out loud the the passage, not in Zarathustra because you've read all that, but in uh, The Gay Science, uh, where he talks about the eternal return of the same because I think it's just such a wonderful passage that... Mm. It People who are listening right now and are still wondering like what could it actually mean and i think it's a good explanation of it so it's aphorism 341 it's fairly brief so i think i'll read it entirely uh and it goes like this the heaviest weight what if someday or night a demon were to steal into your loneliest loneliness and say to you this life as you now live it and have lived it you will have to live once again and innumerable times again and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unspeakably small or great in your life must return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees and even this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence is turned over again and again and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or... Have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought gained power over you, as you are, it would, uh, as you are, it would transform you and possibly crush you. The question in each and everything, do you want this again and innumerable times again, would lie on your actions as the heaviest weight or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life? to long for nothing more fervently than for this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal. So I just wanted to add that because like, I think it's relevant, <laughs> like that, that we actually know what we're talking about and why this could indeed, why I do somewhat intuitively agree that this could be a goal for Nietzsche because the way that he shares that also in that work, and then he dramatically places it in this, in those books, Zarathustra, I somewhat agree. As to the Ubermensch, like, I'm not sure, like I, 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 I'm not like, again, that's why I was doing the research just now on the side a little bit. Like I, um, it doesn't make intuitive sense to me that necessarily simply because at the start of the work and not at, not at the end of the work, that it means there's a progression from here to there. It could also be that 
he changed his level of analysis that first he talks about, okay, what will future society look like? And then he'll talk a little more ontologically, like actually, what does that mean for life? Um, but that's just like the intuition that I have. And therefore also that it seems strange to me that the Ubermensch would only be him. But yeah, I don't have anything concrete to say against it. I'm just saying like, that's a part of the interpretation that I, um, yeah, that I'm not too sure about at the moment, but I respect it <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> Does the view, does the Nietzschean view that he creates in this book, personally, do you guys think it can scale? And 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 what would that look like? Because to me, it sounds like, you know, um, he's criticized a vision and he's creating a vision. Um, there's a prophetic nature to it. Mm -hmm. Does it replace religion? Um and can it play a significant role in society or does it already? I, I, I wouldn't know. You can start GP. It's a, it's a good question. Um, does it play a role? Maybe in, maybe here and there, um, in the sense that various people have been influenced by Nietzsche, um, different sort of musicians and different people that have influence. Um, I think our culture has been slightly influenced by um, by Nietzsche. Um, but then on the other hand, we still have a lot of what Nietzsche would consider to be antithetical to his philosophy. Like we have a lot of idealism as well. Um, and kind of ethic, a huge, a very heavy ethical orientation, um, at the moment. Um, what would, what would, uh, society based on Nietzsche's philosophy look like? Well, I'll talk just a, just a minute about how Lampert sees the eternal return itself, because it's not like the eternal return in a sense is, is a kind of um, Nietzscheanism for the masses. Um, just like Christianity is a Platonism for the masses. This is also controversial, this interpretation as well, but um, there's a question about how serious was Nietzsche about the actual literal truth of eternal return namely that you know the the universe as we know it you know continually repeats itself again and again and again onward forever um did he literally believe that lampert suggests he wasn't committed to it um but what it does is it expresses a orientation to life and so how he interprets interprets zarathustra is that what and what and this is fascinating because again it's based on the text or at least it, it it's resonant with the text when we come to the final um chapters of part three um after zarathustra wills the eternal return who talks about the eternal return as a doctrine not him he doesn't wake up and elucidate it himself his animals do his his serpent and his eagle and they do it in a very metaphysical way. They lay it out as, you know, the doctrine of the universe repeating itself again and again. And so Lampert really highlights that. So for the future society, we've already got this kind of metaphysical doctrine um, that would, that Nietzsche maybe believed would be a grounding for people because he doesn't want everyone to be a philosopher. He doesn't expect them to want to or be able to he thinks that ordinary people are going to continue to be ordinary people but there are ordinary people that are living in greek times and then there are ordinary people that are living in christian times and they are going to have a different experience of reality and a different orientation to it based on the theological views the metaphysical views the religious views um, that are prevalent so it's like he creates a metaphysics for them and it's he also, the second thing he wants to do is to create a, this is according to Lampert, a religion for him, for them. So this is why he emphasizes Dionysus so much, because he knows that ordinary people, they just can't live without religion. It, it's, and he also, he, he's not completely against religion either. He has lots of good things to say about Greek religion, for instance, that the Greek gods are a celebration of earthly life. Um, and so he wants a different kind of God. Uh, he wants a God like Dionysus. Strictly speaking, he wants Dion Dionysus and Ariadne, who's the um, the consort or the wife of um, Dionysus. So you've got this kind of proto 
um, religion or this conception or the sketch of a future religion, which involves um, two earthly deities, a male and a female deity. And Lampert's idea is that Nietzsche doesn't want to create a religion himself, but he's kind of throwing it out there for someone to come along who is more religiously inclined and fill in the details, you know. Would that be a kind of neo-paganism? Probably of some kind. Um, uh, in um, in an essay by um, Lampert where he talks about his theory, he um, really um, praises like indigenous uh, attempts to reconnect with their um, pagan religions, basically, and says this is actually being part of a Nietzschean um, move um, to to have an earthly religion. Um, so, so there you have it. You have a, a metaphysics which is based on um, eternal return, which isn't literally true, but is, um, let's say, true in a deeper sense or a symbolic sense. And you've got a religion which isn't literally true, but is true in a deeper or symbolic sense in the sense that it is true to the earth. It is true to earthly existence. Um, and so uh, Lampert really believes that Nietzsche was trying to engineer um the uh the things that a future society would need um to be Nietzschean what would that look like well it probably would look similar to what we have now I think but just without without the moralizing maybe maybe with more joy maybe with a little more experimentation maybe with a little more I don't know maybe a little less self-control um, but certainly less moralizing Okay. Aaron, anything to add to that? I don't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, there were some background noises, so I had to turn okay. it off for a second. Um, no, it's fascinating to think about everything that, uh, that GP has just said, and that's indeed like in that interpretation. Like, to me, it, it seems, again, like, like I think Nietzsche was a, like a far more chaotic thinker then Lambert presents him to be like I think like you know he he seems to have been very unsure about some of his own projects like uh like there's notes that that I also think include in in, in my thesis that he he writes to other people <clears throat> and to be fair that's a little bit after Zarathustra but nonetheless that he's he doesn't even know with which views he does any good or does any bad like he is really unclear about you know what is like he doesn't know whether what he is doing is actually let's say destroying the world or is actually bringing the good news to humanity and like it seems at some point he was very confused about that and therefore i sometimes i i'm not as convinced by the attempts to kind of make like let's say like a plato's republic out of nietzsche zarathustra because I don't think that, like, I think it's something that Nietzsche deeply wanted to be true. And I do see, like, all those aspects. Like, I'm definitely intrigued to now read more again on, like, all those layers that, 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 that you mentioned. Like, you have the metaphysic, you have the religion, and how all of that ties together. Um, but at the same time, I'm also, like, aware that Nietzsche is someone who was very like secure about the things he was critical of and very insecure about the things he wanted to have in their stead. And like, that's what kind of brings back to the start of this conversation where it's like, this would be like a, a positive vision, but I think Nietzsche is actually very unclear and insecure about what the positive vision should be. And also, and that's more or less, I, I know I'm, I, I keep returning to this, but because it's what my thesis is about, uh, also how clear that should be from Christianity and how clear it can be from Christianity. So I, so I, I, I applaud the attempt and I actually think it's so interesting that like, and this, this is again, what I mean, like it's, this is like the scholar in me that now I'm like, okay, let's, let's finish this conversation. I'll do some research and then we can talk again, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that, but yeah. so, so I, I, which means that it's, it's, it's a good hypothesis because otherwise I would have already been like, no, it's definitely not true because you can read it here. Like, no, I'm actually intrigued to now look into what, to what extent it might be true and to what extent maybe it's a bit more controversial. Um, but I am intuitively not yet convinced by it completely for the reasons that I mentioned. But I am fascinated by it, so I'll say that. Yeah. 
Anything to add to that, GP? Otherwise, I'll ask a question. Uh, no, nothing to add. Okay. Um, so I know Nietzsche wrote a book, Beyond Good and Evil. I know that he chose Zarathustra uh, as a character because Zarathustra was part of Zoroastrian religion, or at least he initiated that in a sense. He's the pivotal figure. And um, that religion, to my understanding, classifies the world as, as good and evil. So it categorizes different parts of, of the world as good and evil. Um, would it be fair to say that Nietzsche rejects looking through that lens of good and evil? That's that's one of the main things, yes. Because while I'm reading all of this and I'm listening to you guys speak, to me, I'm thinking, for me and my worldview, the most important thing might even be goodness itself. Um, why why does he reject that? Like, because <laughs> to me, it's like it's it's one of those things I can't even. I can't even begin to question so, uh, goodness or. I th I think for me this will take us a little bit out outside of the work. So I'll 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 briefly get into this because like this is for me mostly related to um, what he works out in the genealogy of morals that he is against a specific understanding again of uh, good and evil just like it is with God and just like yeah. it is. so so that that's always like a good nuance specifically for him he used to argue that. If you look etymologically to some of the words like good, uh, that it was, it often had like sort of almost like a, 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 a military, uh, like what do you call it, like um, a connotation of belonging to soldiers and to war, that therefore you also see like, you know, if we speak of an interbellum, like we're talking about like the, the period in between two wars. Because a bellum is a, is, a, is is a war in Latin, but at the same time, like we also say, like oh, ciao bello, you know, like we have that notion of that. Oh, actually, bello, like that, that it's it's good, it's beautiful, like there's something good about it. So he actually says, like there's this understanding of good that we used to have clearly, where goodness was related to noble values, where it was about actually the more uh, he actually says, like this was like let's say the master morality, like the 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 better you were at living your life, uh, in some sense, in this life affirming sense the 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 more apt it would be to say that that life is good but it's like it's not a moral good so again we return to like let's say the ethical point it's not like it's almost like okay you're very good at playing football you know but you wouldn't say like oh like you're you're an evil football player it's like no no you're, you're a good football player or a bad football player so he says like you used to have this understanding of goodness and badness and some people were just like they would be able to let's say exert their will to power and for this he used the example of the birds of prey. Like, it's like, okay, you know, like they were violent when they needed to be violent. So it's like, okay, I'm hungry. So let's just grab one of those lambs over there uh, and I'll eat. And it's just like, it's just as simple as that. It's just like, okay, that, that will be my will to power exerting itself and I eat. And therefore they would live a good life. Then you could ask yourself, okay, what would be a bad life is something that actually wants to exert its own will to power, but isn't able to do so. Um, and he says like, now that's interesting because we see that that beings who are not able to exert their own will to power uh, on the earth, they actually grow resentful. So he used that that same example of let's say the 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 little lambs who feel preyed upon by these birds of prey, but they 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 can't do anything about it. Like they can't all of a sudden you know like eat the birds of prey. They're just like oh we're just like poor innocent victims, and this for him would be let's say um, a metaphor for what happened in. Judaism first and then elaborated in Christianity. It's kind of to say that, oh, you know, maybe it's actually not so much that they are good and we are bad at life. It's more so like that they could also not eat us, but they choose to. So they're actually evil. We don't eat us. Like we're good, but we don't even eat them. Like we're good people because we don't exert our will to power, but they do. So actually you start seeing that there's this shift where it's like good birds of prey, bad lambs. And then you actually get like, no, the birds of prey are evil, you know, like, so all powerful people are evil. And actually what's good is people who aren't powerful. So like, let's say the, 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 the innocent victims. And that has some advantages. We could talk about the whole Christian advantage to, to that. But the profound danger is actually that we start saying like, well, it would actually be better if you do not develop yourself, if you just stay powerless and by the way, let's also hate on rich people, for instance, you know, like, because like they're powerful and let's actually try to not become rich ourselves because that would actually include us into them. So, so, so you get all this, this, 
this understanding of like actually it would probably be an evil thing to become powerful and it would be a good thing to be powerless and that's something that's fairly dangerous for him and that understanding of good and evil what it became is like we need to get beyond that so the goodness that you're talking about is not the same goodness as the goodness that is in beyond good and evil but maybe gp has something to add to all this i think that was an excellent um kind of introduction to um to the to the whole the whole Nietzschean setup, um, Aaron, um, <laughs> in terms of morality, um, I, I don't have really anything to add um, except that, um, yeah, to sort of emphasize what you're saying. It's it's, I mean, I don't know exactly how Nietzsche feels about the word good, and obviously. Since I don't speak German, I don't know which word or words he uses in place of good in different places. But um, but does he have a sense of like better and worse? Definitely. Like, does he have a sense of excellence? Definitely. Um, and does he have a sense in which the world is good? Definitely. That's the whole point of Zarathustra. And so I think in that sense, yeah, absolutely. But I think that for Nietzsche, it's not a... It's not a. It's not limited to morality. It's not a. It's not a fundamentally moral sense. No. Um, there's a. There's a goodness that embraces, um, but is wider than just moral goodness, um, and that actually can include moral evil as well, or at least you know badness, um, because it has to, because the world is constituted by violence and the world is good. So. You know, I think Christians could come to a similar type of realization, you know, the sense mm -hmm. that all is the will of God. Um, uh, but but yeah, I, I think that Nietzsche's on board with you. Um, By the way, tied to this specifically, like at some point Nietzsche says in his works, Job, so the book of Job, you know, mm -hmm. Job affirms life. So that's fairly interesting. Yes. He's like, yes. to him, that's actually like a life affirming story. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, Aaron. Wow. Okay. Something we're, we're ending up uh, our conversation right now because Aaron has to go, I think. But I feel like yeah, I, I, I could go on for a bit longer, but we could also finish it up and then talk in the future at some yeah, point. Yeah, I think that would be best because I would open up a lot of things here <laughs> <laughs> that would need more time, I think. Uh, but yeah, I really like this. I think there's a, you know, <laughs> just feels like there's a lot to be said, and I think it's good to focus in on. A book specifically or a topic yeah go ahead i, I do i do want to ask you lucas because you you've actually done fairly little talking here it's like uh you've you've asked some as excellent questions but just what was your impression of the book like how did you enjoy reading the book was it like or was it mostly that the book was very difficult and that it was mostly the video by gp that really helped or was there also something about the book because look gp uh i think rightfully because he's not the only one like says that he had like kind of like this revelatory experience reading the book and many people have that and other people are, are are furiated by it and other people are just confused by it so i'm curious what was it like for you to read that book from beginning to end and maybe in different sections yeah thank you um well it was definitely confusing <laughs> but that's what you're gonna get when this is like one of the first Nietzsche books you read but it was also there are parts of it that i found really hilarious um i noticed really different themes and and tones in the book so it, it felt like sometimes i was i was reading a completely different book and i i don't know who mentioned this maybe it was one of your lectures that you sent me but that, that nietzsche sometimes switches from like this intuitive uh type of writing to like oh this is really his argumentative self <laughs> and that that's yeah that's really funny but um but i after I finished reading it, I was like, I want to read this thing fully again, having integrated all of this information and, and perhaps it feeling more of a, um, a leisure activity. I think that that can promote more of, um, an experience with the book because right now I was also kind of on a time schedule, you know, <laughs> trying to mm -hmm. finish it. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, like I said before in the talk, I find it hard to reject ideas I don't really understand fully. So I want to really understand Nietzsche better than I do now before I can really say uh, how I feel about the ideas. And other than that, my, my just general experience of it was, it was quite enjoyable most of the time. 
because I feel like reading Nietzsche, I've read a bit of his other stuff. This to me comes closest to what I'm interested in at the moment. So it's a bit more, um, a bit more intuitive, a bit more mythical it feels. And like, mm -hmm. I like it when people process ideas inside of uh, sort of a story of some sorts. Mm -hmm. And then watching uh, GP's videos was, was amazing because he would pull up parts that I've already read and then um, place mm -hmm. them inside of these different parts of the book and like how, how they make sense with each other, how they interact with each other. So uh, that that was really cool as well. But I was more outside of reading the book was, was watching the video. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But um, but yeah, I, I, I will definitely read it again because I feel that this is a very important book to read. Um, important because of how important it was for Nietzsche. And I think Nietzsche is someone mm -hmm. that people are paying more and more attention to, have paid a lot of attention to, has had a lot of influence and deserves to be understood um, and longed to be understood in a sense, I feel, reading him. And yeah. so uh, mm -hmm. I will try to try to do that but yeah it's good that's good yeah and by the way like nishitani uh when he was younger kane nishitani he also yeah. carried around a copy of thus spoke zarathustra with him everywhere he went which is also fairly interesting and yeah it gives people, me like, a sign you know so like so it, it's 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 a work that has continued to stay alive um yeah exactly that's why i feel it's important um mm -hmm. any last words gp um as you were talking, I was just thinking, um, and this is purely my opinion, but I think that Nietzsche provides the strongest um, objection or alternative, alter objection is the wrong word. Nietzsche provides the strongest alternative to a Christian worldview. This is coming from someone who's not committed to Nietzsche, but not committed to a Christian worldview, is trying to still explore and feel my way through it. That's why these conversations are so valuable. But my opinion is he provides the strongest alternative we're seeing a kind of Christian renaissance right now in many ways, or a religious renaissance. Um, and I feel like it can be really useful to delve into Nietzsche or Zarathustra specifically to, to address that and to um, either integrate it or find out why we should reject it. Um, because personally, in the way these ideas are battling themselves out in me, it feels like a really viable um, alternative. Um, and so that's a little bit of a challenge, I guess, to any any listeners who want to try and tackle Nietzsche, either to say why why we should reject him or why he's actually not that different, maybe, than mm. the worldview that they've embraced, if they've embraced a Christian worldview. So that's I, my final thought on that. Good. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is the final thought, but I just like I, I like this comes to mind. It, either it could be like let's say a start of a of, of a next conversation, but it's related to everything you said, GP. So like that's why I wanna wanna um yeah introduce it here. So if you look, I'm I'm specifically reminded of uh, John Verveke's, well, both his criticism of romanticism and his ecology of practices, and those two are related. So when he discusses mm -hmm. romanticism, he kind of says like it's almost like there was this understanding that we should go against this rationalistic understanding of reality and bring in like let's say more of the irrational and the passion so you have all this great art and wonderful poems but he kind of says like but at the same time it's like it's a little bit bullshitting ourselves in the frankfurtian sense because it's like because it rejects the notion that this could at all be rational and kind of says like it's all irrational that's one part but also it is no ecology of practices to tie it to so it has all it has all this art and people read it and experience it but they don't like do it like let's say communally except for maybe some of the festivals that could be mm -hmm. an interesting exception and the reason why that's relevant is because nietzsche grew up in that environment in the uh during romanticism and that's really mm -hmm. what the first thing that he found uh, extremely interesting and like that's why he loved Va Va Wagner so much and later on actually he thought romanticism was kind of like this escape from life so he, he more or less rejected it but what's interesting and that's why I think it's worth talking about uh, exactly what you mentioned like after Nietzsche there is he mostly get gets picked up fruitfully by his by by artists as well so like you have all these great authors who write great works of Lit literature in which they try to incorporate some of these Nietzschean ideas and I think like Hermann Hesse is like a very good example mm -hmm. of that um, but at the same time you have people like uh, 
uh, Richard Strauss, obviously, who write that like who have this this piece like uh, Also Sprach Zarathustra. So you also have him appear a little bit in music, and then obviously in some visual art as well. But I'm curious, like, to what extent are we ready to go beyond that criticism we could have of Romanticism? Because like that's again art that incorporates some of the ideas, but is actually mm -hmm. art that is tied to an ecology of practices. So what would a Nietzscheanism look like mm -hmm. tied to an ecology of practices? So that's just a thought that came to mind, and but definitely not something we could probably discuss right we now. Continue. So uh, yeah, that's a good, a a, a good prelude. I think it's <laughs> good to introduce the next one. If you guys are willing, I would love to, uh, to continue this. Yes. Always. Always. Good. Always. All right. I'll stop here.